mystery, wisdom, and spirituality. India is known to have produced many saints, sages, and holy men. These illumined beings glorify a spiritual past unequal in the history of mankind. Now there are rumors of another exceptional being living in India. His reputation is illustrious. Miracles formerly associated with Jesus Christ are an everyday part of his life. Millions in India and throughout the world consider him to be an avatar that is a divine incarnation. His name is Sri Satya Sai Baba. He exhibits all the characteristics of a divine incarnation. Those of omniscience, a consciousness aware of all events, omnipresence, being in all time and space, and omnipotence, being all-powerful. The prophecy of a world teacher or enlightened being who will lead all mankind into the path of love and truth can be found in the scriptural text of most of the world religions. Also, major prophets of the last few centuries concur in their predictions of a calamitous period toward the end of this century, followed by a thousand years of peace. So it seems the life and teachings of Satya Sai Baba fulfill prophecies of many religious and spiritual viewpoints. Sai Baba was born November 23, 1926. Musical instruments played on their own accord. Also, a cobra was found under the newborn baby. Early in life, he displayed a special nature by refusing to participate in any activities that were harmful to animals, like cockfighting or bullock races on the riverbed. He would continuously invite beggars and the poor to his house for his mother and sister to feed. As a child, he was precocious, astounding everyone with his musical talents. He wrote and performed plays with spiritual and moral lessons to adults. Young Satya always had a group of followers whom he constantly amazed by giving them sweets from an empty bag or turning frogs into swallows that flew away. He also taught them devotional songs in praise of God. On October 20th, 1940, young Satya suddenly announced, I am no longer yours. I am Sai. I do not belong to you. My devotees are calling, and I have work to do. He started his mission in his 14th year and taught those devoted to him songs glorifying God. The early devotees were enchanted by an endless flow of miracles, like producing a person's favorite kind of fruit on a wish-fulfilling tree which overlooked Puddha Party. He would feed all who came to him 
by passing his hand over containers of food. He would heal the sick and counsel those present on a spiritual way of life. He performed medical operations with surgical instruments that would suddenly appear as he needed them and vanish when he was through with the operation. He began appearing to devotees in faraway places in his physical body. On festival days, while participating in parades, the booty, which is sacred ash, would form on his forehead. Later, the ash would change colors. He would select flowers from garlands and scatter them. As they fell, they turned into medallions with different forms of God on them. His personality was irresistible and his fame spread. Since love is formless, I do materializations as evidence of my love. It is merely a symbol. I do so not because of any need or desire to exhibit my powers. For me, this is to convince people of my love for them. So far as I'm concerned, this is evidence of my divinity. It is not by any means an exhibition of divinity. What I materialize is a manifestation of divinity with a potent significance as well as symbolism. It is symbolic of the cosmic, immortal, and infinite nature of all forms of God. That is, what is left when everything worldly, transient, and changeable has burned away. In the first place, it is symbolic of the life-death cycle in which everything ultimately reduces itself to ash. For dust thou art, and unto dust shall thou returnest. Ash or dust is the final condition of things. It cannot undergo any farther change. In the spiritual context, it constitutes a warning to the receiver to give up desire, temptations, and make oneself pure in thought word, and deed. In order to press home this lesson, I materialize ash for those who come to me with love and devotion. It acts as a talisman, healing the sick and giving protection to those who need it. My power to protect, heal, save, and materialize objects originate in God and can be used only by an avatar. The conflict between persons who accept God and deny God and those who declare that God can be found in this place and those who affirm that God can be found nowhere is never ending. While considering this situation, one has to remember that while it is unnecessary to awaken a person already awake and easy to awaken a person who is asleep, we cannot, however much we try, awaking a person pretending to be asleep. The divine is now denoted by various words that are common currency in a limited human vocabulary. These words describe and propose a meaning to the divine. Miraculous, magical, wondrous, etc. Of course men cannot contain in their minds more than they can hold. They cannot express into words the inexpressible. Only those who have dived deep and contacted the underlying principle of love can picture divinity with some clarity. The divine can be grasped only through love. Reason is too feeble an instrument to measure it. Denial of the divine cannot negate it. Logic cannot reveal it. Be true to yourselves and do not waver. I am unaffected by the praise or blame. My love and compassion envelops all. My grace can be shared by all. I am declaring this to you so you may face life with fortitude. Man can be transformed into a noble, efficient, happy, 
and disciplined member of society by the implanting of good thoughts, good feelings, good deeds, and good emotions. Such transformed persons will spontaneously engage themselves in the task of promoting human welfare. They will be the promoters of the ideals of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. The followers of each religion call upon one God who is omnipresent and listens to their prayers, be they from any race or whatever language they speak. But it is the same God who confers happiness upon all mankind. No religion has a separate God showering grace only upon those who profess to abide by that faith. It is the destiny of man to journey from humanness to divinity as he has already journeyed from animalness. In this pilgrimage, he is bound to encounter various obstacles and trials. In order to smooth his path and help him overcome those troubles, sages, seers, realized souls, divine personalities, and incarnation of God have appeared among men to illumine the path. They move among the afflicted, the seekers who have lost their way, and lead them into confidence and courage. Certain personalities are born and live out their days for this very purpose. Such guides, examples, leaders appear among all peoples and in all lands. They inspire faith in high ideals and teach as if their voice is the voice of God. Jesus set an example of peace, love, charity, and faith. Sai Baba uses his magnetic appeal to encourage all people to accept the simple truth, God is love. His teachings in life reflect the same aim, that of making people realize their closeness to God and instilling qualities of love and truth into their lives. By his actions, he instills faith, hope, and belief in God. He gives all who comes with open heart peace. He feeds and clothes the sick and poor, educates children all over India, provides medical services to the needy, rescues devotees from disaster all over the world. He counsels, guides, and directs spiritual seekers from all the world religions. He has even restored life to those who have been pronounced clinically dead. Miracles, as they are called, are part of his mission. They awaken and inspire faith in God as they represent and reflect his will. By using miracles in his mission, he shows glimpses of the unlimited power he commands. He never uses his power for personal gain, but always to encourage and inspire faith in God. The real miracle is Sai Baba's love, which is the message of his mission. His life is forever involved in helping, inspiring, strengthening, and sustaining the love of his devotees by his example. His life is truly his message, an offering of love to those afflicted of body, mind, and spirit. The love he shows transcends racial and religious barriers, saying to all, there is only one religion, the religion of love. Bye. 
Whenever grief and anxiety overwhelms the world, the Lord will incarnate in human form to re-educate the human community into the path of peace. At the present time, strife and discord have robbed peace and unity from the family, the school, the community, the cities, and the state. This is the secret of God coming down as man. The Lord has to come at intervals so that those who have won the right to be liberated may be saved. I do not appreciate in the least distinctions between various appearances of God. I do not proclaim that this is important or the other is less important. Continue your worship of your chosen God along the lines already familiar to you. Then you will find that you are coming nearer and nearer to me. There is no need to change your chosen God and adopt a new one when you have seen me and heard me. The Lord is love itself. I have come to give to you the key of the treasure of bliss, to tell you how to tap the spring, for you have forgotten the way to blessedness. If you waste this chance of saving yourself, it is just your fate. You come to me for tinsels and trash, the petty little cures and promotions, worldly joys and comforts. Very few of you desire to get from me the thing I have come to give you, liberation itself. And even among those few, those who stick to the path of spiritual discipline and who ultimately succeed, are a handful. I am always aware of the future, the past, as well as the present of every one of you. So I am not so moved by mercy. Since I know the past, the background, the reaction is different. It is your consequence of evil deliberately done in the previous birth. So I allow your suffering to continue, often modified by some little compensation. I do not cause either joy or grief. You are the designer of both these chains that bind you. I am always full of bliss. The avatar takes the human form and behaves in a human way so that humanity can feel kinship with divinity. At the same time, he rises to godly heights so that mankind can also aspire to reach God. The realization of the indwelling God as the motivator of life is the task for which avatars come in human form. Today, evil is so widespread that humanity itself would be destroyed in a nuclear holocaust in the event of a world war. It is to prevent such a catastrophe that this avatar has come, to raise human consciousness above the existing syndrome of anger, hate, violence, and war. This can be achieved only by the reestablishment of the brotherhood of mankind. There are two ways in which an avatar can help people. An instant solution is against a long-term one. Any instant solution would go against the fundamental quality of nature itself as well as the karmic law of cause and effect. Most people live in the material worlds of their desires and egos, which is governed by this law. They reap the fruits of their actions. This brings about their evolution or devolution. If the avatar intervenes to instantly solve their problems, it would stop all action, development, even evolution. This solution can be ruled out because it totally negates the natural laws. The other and more effective alternative presents a long-term solution whereby the avatar leads the people themselves to a higher level of consciousness to enable them to understand the truth of spiritual laws so that they may turn toward righteousness and steadfastly work for better conditions. This would relate them back to nature and the law of causation. They would then transcend the cycle of cause and effect in which today they are involved as victims and thereby learn to control the natural forces 
to avert calamities. If I cure everything instantly, leaving people at their present level of consciousness, they would soon mess things up again and be at one another's throat, with the results of the same chaotic conditions developing in the world. So, if the avatar brings these calamities to an immediate end, which I can and do when there is a great need, the whole drama of creation with the karmic law will collapse. Remember, these calamities occur not because of what God has made of man, but really because of what man has made of man. Therefore, man has to be remade with his ego destroyed and replaced by a transcendent consciousness. Jesus was a master born with a purpose, the mission of restoring love, charity, and compassion into the hearts of man. He had no attachment to the self. He never paid heed to sorrow, pain, joy, or gain. He had a heart that responded to the call of anguish, the cry for peace and brotherhood. He went about the land preaching the lesson of love and poured out his life as a libation and sacrifice to humanity. Jesus was the name he was known by. He was honored by the populace as Christ, for they found in his thoughts, words, and deeds no trace of ego. He had no envy or hatred. He was full of love, charity, humility, and sympathy. Jesus came as the embodiment of love and compassion and lived among men holding forth the highest ideals of life. You must pay attention to the lessons he elaborated in the various stages of his life. I am the messenger of God, he declared. Yes, each individual has to accept that role and live as examples of divine love and charity. Jesus wandered in lonely places for 12 years, engaging himself in study, spiritual exercises, and meditation on God. Jesus spent five years in the Himalayas, realizing he was the Christ when he was 25. He traveled in India, Persia, Tibet, Egypt, and other countries. He searched for the divine in the objective world of nature, but he soon realized that nature is a kaleidoscopic picture created by one's own imagination and sought God within himself. Here in India, his stay in the Himalaya monasteries in Kashmir brought him greater success. From the attitude of being a messenger of God, he declared that he was the son of God. For the old attitude meant duality, a master-servant relationship. One could not then move beyond the orders of the master. One had to carry out the duties laid down in the scriptures. This he found irksome, for he felt that he was the image, while God was the original. This bond of relationship increased. With heart consciousness in the ascendant, you feel nearness and dearness, and so the father-son bond seems natural at this stage. Later, as this consciousness stabilized, Jesus declared, I and my father are one. Jesus said that the bread taken in the Last Supper was his flesh and the wine his blood. He meant that all beings alive with flesh and blood are to be treated as he himself and that no distinction should be made as to friend or foe, we are they. Everybody is his body, sustained by the bread. Every drop of blood flowing in the veins of every living being is his animated by the activity that the wine imparts to it. That is to say, every man is divine and should be revered as such. When Jesus came, he washed the feet of all people, which means, I am your servant and am serving you, so you in your turn should serve the world. Follow Jesus Christ. Decide to direct your lives along the path he laid down. 
His words must be imprinted on your hearts, and you must resolve to practice all that he taught. We are true Christians only when we live according to the teachings of Jesus and practice them in daily life. Jesus was a person whose only joy was in spreading divine love, offering divine love, and living divine love. That was the life and message of Jesus. Nurture it in your hearts. God is man and man is God. All of us have something of God, the divine spark within us. All men are divine like myself, but with the spirit embodied in human flesh and bone. The only difference is they are unaware of this Godhood. They have come into this karmic prison through the mistakes of many lives. I have taken this mortal form out of my own free will. They are bound to the body while I'm free of this bondage. The main difference is they are shoved hither and thither by desire. I have no desire but the Supreme One to make them desireless. We all belong to the same divine principle. The godliness which is present in everyone in the form of a little spark exists in me as the full flame. It is my mission to develop every little spark of God in everyone to the fullness of the divine flame. To the doubting or confused ones, I give this illustration. Those who want to secure pearls from the sea have to dive deep to secure them. It does not help to dabble among the shallow waves near the shore and say the sea has no pearls and all stories about them are false. Likewise, if a person wants to secure the love and grace of this avatar, he must dive deep and get submerged in Sai Baba. I preach only one religion of love for all, which alone can integrate the human race into a brotherhood of man under the fatherhood of God. I know only one language of the heart beyond the mind or intellect, which relates man to man and mankind to God. On this basis, I want to build one humanity without any religious, racial, other barriers in a universal empire of love so none has to give up his religion or deity but through them worship the one God in all I never see or make any distinctions between the rich and poor I only look at them from the viewpoint of their devotion their desires the sacrifices they are willing to make and their troubles the rich as well as the poor come to Sai Baba to seek love peace, and liberation from their problems or troubles. My prescription to them is absolute selflessness and desirelessness. To the poor this is a natural state or condition. So my love flows to them to embrace their devotion. Thus they obtain my grace. The rich on the other hand cannot secure this grace without surrendering their materialistic outlooks and selfish attachments. So it becomes necessary for them to sacrifice material greed to receive spiritual grace. I tell them, ego lives by getting and forgetting. Love lives by giving and forgiving. Life without desire brings divinity to man. And those who seek my grace must shed desire and greed. Riches provide a fatal temptation. They are the source and cause of human bondage. The desire to raise the standard of living can never be satisfied. It leads to a multiplication of wants and consequent troubles and frustrations. We have to convince people that the idea of a high standard of living is wrong. It must be replaced with a high level of living and thinking on the basis of humility, morality, compassion and detachment as against the existing greed for competitive luxury. People have to be convinced that the only way to rouse the latent divinity in them is to master desire 
and conquer greed for pleasure and luxury instead of being a slave to these false materialistic values. Man's natural state is happiness, and he cannot be blamed for craving that which is his own. But man is making a serious mistake. He believes that the happiness for which he craves comes from objects which he can experience. What is the remedy? The remedy is to consider the truth, which is that there is only one everlasting, never-failing happiness, and that is God. To drink of that ever-flowing spring of happiness, you must turn to yourself, to the divine, which however obscured is the resident of your heart, the subtle truth of your being. Love is the vital and essential reality of spiritual life. In human life, love takes a number of various aspects. Love for the wife and children, for various habits and indulgences, for various objects and ideas, and for God. God is love, and he is there in every aspect of love. Although love, which is God, appears to be modified and even distorted in man, yet truly that divine love remains pure and perfect. The love in man which is pure and perfect is his love for God. Only love for God is perfect. Gather your love from all aspects of your life, and let it flow as one strong, deep river of love for God. Happiness and peace shall be yours. 
Life without desire means the realization of the pure genuine one self that is spirit. Bound to desire, the self degenerates into selfishness. Spirit turns into ego. The way to self-realization is to cleanse the self of this ego of selfishness. Then you reach a state of consciousness beyond the mind or intellect, revealing the true self, that is God. The mind is like a cloth that covers and stifles consciousness. The threads are which are desires. If we give up the desires, the threads fall and the cloth disappears, revealing our true nature. One has, therefore, to raise consciousness beyond the mind to achieve self-realization. To gain the infinite universal spirit, the embodied self must break out of the puny, finite little prison of individuality. Desire belongs to the senses, the brain, the mind. Once you become free of it, you will realize the self, the spirit, consciousness, enlightenment, and become one with the cosmic power. Self-realization is God-realization. Thus man reaches God. Cultivate the spiritual practice of prayer as a normal way of life. All prayers arising from pure love with unselfish eagerness to render service will reach God directly. Love alone can reveal to you the divinity latent in all. Love is God. Live in love. Love is selflessness. Selfishness is lovelessness. Do not waste your life pursuing the narrow interest of the self. Become what you truly are, the embodiment of love. No matter how others treat you or what they think of you, do not worry. Love for your own evolution and not for what others may say. Do not imitate others. Cultivate your own life. You have your own heart, your own opinions, your own ideas, your own will. Why then imitate? Imitation is human but creation is divine. Follow your chosen path. Let your own experience of God be your guide and master. Do not go to the grave copying others. You won't find God if you search in the outside world. Your own heart shining with love is God's love. Follow the master. Face the devil. Fight to the end. Finish the game. The true you is God. Others think of you as the personality. You are truly infinite divine spirit. When you become all-embracing infinite love, the divine will manifest in and through you. Cultivate not riches nor comforts and luxuries, but divine virtues. Speak softly and give comfort with every glance of yours. Do not be a slave to your sensual desires. Conquer lust and vanquish anger. Exile from your mind greed, hate, and jealousy. Dedicate your hands to the service of mankind. To resurrect love and compassion, you must kill jealousy and selfishness. Purify your heart. Then you will become fit to receive God's grace. God is interested in your heart, not your money. He is interested in your character and not your caste or religion. Born as a human being, endowed with this powerful intelligence and the innate spark of divinity, you must realize that and come to understand your own nature. Man indulges in actions which are selfish to the core from the moment he gets up till he goes to bed at night. He lets himself be bound by selfish ideas. He does not care for others. You should try to understand the oneness of all. Even as you are involved in your daily routine, you should have a feeling of brotherhood amongst your fellow man. The inner significance of life is to make the journey from the state of I to the state of we. Love for all should spontaneously flow from your heart and sweeten all your words. The best spiritual discipline that can help man is love. Foster the tiny seed of love that clings to me and mine. Let it sprout into love for the group around you and grow into love for all of mankind. 
Let the love enfold all things and beings in all the world. Proceed from less love to more love, narrow love to expanded love. When you know that you are but a spark of the divine and that all else are the same divine sparks, you will look upon all with reverence and true love. Your heart will be filled with supreme joy. Man is seeking joy in far off places, in quiet spots, not knowing that the spring of joy is in his heart. Love is God. God is the embodiment of perfect love, so he can be known and realized, reached and won only through love. You can see the moon only with the help of moonlight. You can see God through the rays of love. See through the eyes of love. All beings are beautiful. Expand into universal love. This is the path which will bring out the divinity in you. Sai Baba appears. My heart opens. I feel his love and grace upon me. I am aware everyone is visually affected and struggles within themselves to feed on the love which emanates from him. We long for a look, a glance, a word, for we are willing captives of his entrancing nature. He moves slowly toward the darshan line. My mind wants the moment to last forever. The present becomes so peaceful. My thoughts are of peace and love and within myself. I feel love for all those around me. Sai Baba's grace is infinite. We are blessed to be contemporaries of the Lord. To know Him is to love Him. I am aware His grace is available to anyone willing to open himself to it. It knows no caste, creed, race, color, or any human limitation. My heart is filled with peace and bliss as I experience His grace. Any thoughts of the outer world are suddenly washed away. His presence is total and complete. My mind struggles to understand as I perceive how beautiful He is. His jet black hair somehow reveals His uniqueness. An aura of light can be seen or felt all around Him. His presence is magnetic, inspiring, yet tranquil. I try to comprehend His glory, but relinquish to the heart the experience. My heart opens to waves of love, and somehow within myself, I feel a great peace consume me. My breathing becomes deep, and I feel at one with everything and love for all. Then my mind again becomes active by perceiving a blue color around his head. Then I see the blue turn to gold. I am aware how perfect he is. As he walks or flows, I know not which across the ashram grounds. His movements are beautiful to behold. My heart is full, and I am at peace. I try to follow his every movement to capture forever this feeling of bliss. My attention is drawn to his hand as it forms a familiar pose. Without a doubt, I realize I am protected and guided by the Lord. I know that divinity is visiting us and catering to us. The Lord is in the form of Sai Baba. As I analyze his every movement, I am aware his presence is in my heart. I realize we are here to find peace and love in the avatar. Every movement of his is glorious to behold. They infer grace, beauty, splendor of unlimited proportions as the avatar relates to each one of us personally. Though the moment is sudden and somehow unexpected, the aftermath of his passing is felt within the hearts of all who witness his darshan. The inner being of soul is touched in a personal, unique way, never to be the same again. His darshan glorifies me and elevates my consciousness to a higher place. 
Each time I see him, my soul assumes more prominence in the evolution of my consciousness. My heart anxiously awaits another glance, a look, or motion of any kind directed toward me. I long to be close to him, to be in his presence always. From the depths of my soul, I want I know not what, as I see him move toward the temple. My mind realizes Darshan will soon be over. I suddenly feel a slight sadness knowing he will remove himself physically from my sight. But just as quickly, I feel lifted out of myself and again at peace. I feel his grace upon me, in me, around me, and forever with me as long as I remember him. I am filled with the desire to know God, realizing simultaneously that I can only benefit from him, but never understand him. I again become aware of his movements and enjoy the grace and beauty of his motion. It is like a cosmic play proceeding according to his will. He has touched me in some mysterious way and I feel so very fortunate. He allows the devotees a final look and then it's over. I hold the moment as long as I can. My mind returns to the present I am again part of the objective world, but somehow I have been transformed. Somewhere inside myself, I realize my future is assured. See with the eyes of love, hear with the ears of love, work with the hands of love, think only of love. I have come to light the lamp of love in your hearts, to see that it shines day by day with added luster. I have not come to speak on behalf of any particular religion, like the Hindu religion. I have not come on any mission of publicity for any sect or creed or cause nor have I come to collect followers for any doctrine. I have no plan to attract followers into my fold or any fold. I have come to tell you of this universal, unitary faith, this path of love, this duty to love, this obligation to love. May you develop this divine love and stand out as harbingers of a new age, free from selfishness, greed, hatred, and violence. Let each of you be a light unto himself or herself, and thereby be a light unto others. All religions teach one basic discipline, the removal from the mind of the blemish of egoism, of running after little joys. Every religion teaches man to fill his being with the glory of God and evict the pettiness of conceit. It trains him in the methods of detachment and discrimination so that he may aim high and attain liberation. Believe that all hearts are motivated by the one and only God, that all faiths glorify the one and only God, that all names in all languages and all forms man can conceive denote the one and only God. Foster love, live in love, spread love. This is the message of love I bring to you.